Good morning and welcome. I'm Professor Melinda Edwards and it is my pleasure to be your tour guide for our exciting journey into the future this morning. I'd like to start by acknowledging the Turbul and Yuggera as the First Nations owners of the land upon which we host this event today. We recognise that these have always been places of teaching, learning and research and we acknowledge the really important role that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders play in our QUT community. We've recently acknowledged that in our blueprint of which we are very proud. Now, for those of you who haven't joined us before, and particularly for those of you joining us from overseas, welcome. We are QTX. We're physically situated in the Graduate School of Business at Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane, in beautiful Australia. Our business is executive education. We bring together discipline experts from across all of our faculties and create real world education solutions for our corporate and government partners. Through this series, our Real World Futures series, we get to do even more. We get to go further into the future, in fact, bring our discipline experts to you to offer their insights into the future of learning and living and working. With you, our community, in that way, making us a truly civic university and also giving us the opportunity to learn from you through your questions, your perspectives, to ensure that our research and our teaching remain relevant to your needs. So, how will today work? Well, firstly, I will introduce our two excellent experts. Then during their presentations, you are very welcome to lodge any questions you'd like them to consider in the Q&A tab. And if you have a look at the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. That's different from the chat icon that you might have used previously. Whilst the chat will be functional for this event, we'd encourage any questions you'd like addressed by our panellists to please be put into the question and answer tab. Because there, our lovely Christy Hammond, who's our QTX corporate partnership manager who works across the education sector. She'll be there monitoring those questions, theming them and coming up with something that represents a cross section of them to present on your behalf during the question time, which will follow our speakers this morning. Now to why we are all really here, two of the shiniest stars in our faculty of education, Professor Susan Danby and Professor Simone White. They both have very long and impressive CVs, which I'd encourage you to read by visiting the QUT website at some time. This morning, I'd like to give you an insight into the amazing human beings they are as well, particularly given today's topic. Now, Professor Susan Danby began as a preschool teacher in a three teacher primary school in regional Queensland. She grew up in rural Queensland near the home of Walsing Matilda. Her first five years of primary schooling were through the Correspondence School and School of the Air. She recalls how she and her brothers would climb out the window and head up to the nearest paddock to go mustering all day, only coming home at dusk. And in these COVID times, she is keen to reassure parents that there are many kinds of experiences that can be important in the home environment. She taught in Chicago in Head Start preschool programs where many of the families and children were refugees or living in communities of great poverty. She tells me it was these experiences that informed her commitment to supporting the diversity of families, especially quality education for young children. She's director of the Australian Research Council Centre for Excellence for the Digital Child, which involves six Australian universities, 13 international universities and 19 partner organisations. The centre is focused on supporting Australian children to be healthy, educated and connected to the digital world. Now, when Susan has completed her presentation, she will hand straight over to Simone. So I'll introduce Simone now so that you have some background on her as well. So Professor Simone White is the Associate Dean for International and Engagement Activities in the Faculty of Education. Simone is passionate about teacher education and how best to support the teaching profession. Simone tells me she grew up in mostly rural and regional communities across New South Wales, attending more than 10 different schools while her own parents sought to work and educate themselves remotely. She taught in a range of primary school settings before she took on her current career as a teacher educator. And she's currently working on a book that showcases rural education innovation. And she draws from cases across the world in that work. She's loving her new role and the opportunity to develop professional development programs for teachers and educators. So ladies and gentlemen, buckle your seatbelts for an excellent journey. I'll now hand over to the first of our speakers, Professor Susan Danby. 
Uh, good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to have such interest, national and international, in the future of learning during this pandemic time. Learning and educators. Learning and education are intertwined and one cannot happen without the other. I'll focus on being a learner and Simone will focus on being an educator. Can we speak of one without the other? That's a topic for discussion for another day, perhaps. But today we are treating these as both intertwined and as separate. Learners. In our current COVID times, we've had to learn a lot of new skills, haven't we? How to use Zoom, learn new routines such as physical distancing, and learn how to juggle work and family. I'm sure you'll all agree that these are really new ways of engaging every day, these new learnings, and they've been somewhat uncomfortable at times. Being a learner is not necessarily a comfortable experience, as you've no doubt discovered. I'm reminded of Piaget, a famous Swiss, Swiss biologist and psychologist, somewhat considered out of date now in many ways, but I've always appreciated his metaphor of disequilibrium. Disequilibrium, the state when we come across new information that has to be fitted into our existing understandings. And this is what forces the learning process. And I'm sure today we all feel that we are experiencing this state of disequilibrium in these recent times as we've had to grapple with so very much. In a heartbeat, the world has changed. We all know and are experiencing these seismic shifts. COVID-19 has brought greater anxiety and transformations in how families and education are occurring and what this means for future learning. Can we snap back to what life was before? Are we now in a new normal? Of course, these are whole of society questions. And today we'll be considering the values, implications and risks of getting learning right in a post-COVID world, or maybe in an ongoing COVID-19 world without a vaccine. These images here point to one of the greatest changes for families and educators these recent months. There is no doubt now that digital technology has come to the fore. Let's look at how digital technology, especially for families and young children, have changed in recent months. Prior to the pandemic, the media often focused on the risks of a digital online world for children. Media, as these headlines show, most often pointed to the potential dangers of digital technologies. At the same time, families were getting really mixed messages about screen and digital technology use. For instance, the National 24-Hour Movement Guidelines recommend limiting the amount of digital technology, framing it as a potential risk for young children's healthy development. National education guidelines, on the other hand, tend to promote digital technology much more positively, framing it as opportunities for access to knowledge and to learning. It's not a surprise then that families and educators, health professionals, and those working in the technology space are not sure about what and who to believe, and what the role is for digital technology in young children's lives. The COVID world has brought about an abrupt shift in this debate. There is no longer a question about if digital technology should be in the lives of young children, but rather the fact that it now is, and is now considered a necessary everyday activity. Let's look at the next slide that shows this shift. This shift here is to the value of the digital in supporting positive futures for children. But there are still concerning images here. Many of the images in this COVID world of children and family have images of digital technology as the primary source of learning. Can we now be considered a learner without a digital device? Do we need the internet for learning to occur? What can we take forward from what we've learned so far with the pandemic. Where do we start? I have four points that for me stand out as markers towards where we direct our attention and our endeavors as we move forward. There is no simple solution or fix to these. These cannot be addressed solely within educational institutions or family. These are wicked problems as they require complex understandings and actions and a stance that recognizes that this is a society wide matter to address. The first point I've already discussed, while there has been mixed views about digital technology and its role in learning previously, this view no longer holds up. The question then becomes, what are the best kinds of digital technology for learning? 
Not all technology for learning is valuable, as I've shown in some recent research on this. The industrial age and the age of machinery brought about massification of education. The societal expectation that schooling was for everyone. We now face the outcome that massification of schooling will be intertwined with the massification of digital technology. With digital technology, we again need to ask the same questions asked of education when available universally. What is quality education? What are the principles that underpin learning? What is quality digital technology for learning? The second point we've learned is that schools offer much more than education and learning. School offers safe places, safe havens for children. We know from Beyond Blue and other health agencies that families are being exposed to domestic violence. Further, many schools offer breakfast programs and attend to other pastoral care activities. Schools are safe places for physical activity. Lunch times are learning opportunities for physical and social play. The current pandemic has made this function of schools very obvious. In this time, we as a society have learned that we need to value schools as safe places for children. The third point is that learning is not a simple transfer from the classroom to online or from the classroom to home. This is not an either or situation. We want classrooms, homes and learning in sync with one another. What does this hybrid learning space look like? What does this mean for schools and formal education? The role of museums, of libraries, for thinking about how we teach. What is so exciting is new kinds of learning emerging, learning embedded within real world activities. I've loved watching the Queensland Symphony Orchestra hold their free online concerts. A zoo is streaming online how to milk a snake and feed a crocodile. All point to learning opportunities being increasingly offered in informal settings with partnerships being built between families and educators. Let's hope that they continue and have the funding that they need. The fourth point most glaringly is that many Australian families are with limited or no access to the internet and digital devices. Without this, there is actually no digital learning. Many are missing out. The Australian Bureau of Statistics reports that 97% of Australian families do not have the internet at home because they cannot afford it. This sounds pretty good, right? But that actually means that three out of every 100 families cannot even connect into a digital world. And in some of our communities, we know that maybe not even a handful of children in the classroom have internet at home or even a digital device. Yesterday, I spoke to the Smith family, the wonderful organization that does so much to support disadvantaged children and families. They reported that right now, 25% of their families have no way to connect to the internet. All of their families may have a single phone in the household, but may only have very, very limited data. These families have been trying to access education for children through their phone. To support these families, they've been providing digital inclusion packs that include a device and a dongle with some gigs, plus tech and digital literacy support. What innovative ways can we bring together government, business, education and social service agencies to work together to ensure more equitable access? Rural communities are being disadvantaged because they do not have reliable internet access, even if they have the devices at home. Other families may have the economic means to afford digital technology, but the fear of digital technology and the thoughts of risk to privacy and children's learning have prompted families to make a conscious decision to be digital free in the home. These families have made this de deliberate choice and they too are disadvantaged in this pandemic. For them, it was too late to shift perspectives and expectations to even being able to buy a digital device. And as someone who tried to buy a new laptop at the start of this pandemic, I can say, that probably along with many of you, that it was impossible to find one to buy. What has been laid bare to politicians, educators and communities, to all of us, what we have learned is that educators know the communities in which they live and teach. They know that there is inequitable access to digital life. And educators are amazing in adapting their school programs to guiding families at home. In some communities that where their families have digital access, these schools appear to have almost seamlessly made the shift to online communities. 
but of course that is with double the work. In other schools, teachers know that the families are not able to go digital, and so they've put together learning packs for families that don't involve digital tools. And they use the old fashioned technology of picking up the phone and talking with parents and children. We are learning that educators are professional and expert in understanding what learning is and how to deliver it. So this is the other lesson that we have learned. Educators know their communities and they are adept at translating learning into what is appropriate for their learning communities. They have known this for years and years and now the public too know this. The next slide highlights the debates around whether children should be learning at home or going back to school. And I want to present two perspectives here. The first is a report, about five reports commissioned by the national government that states that up to half of Australian children will be adversely affected by the shift to remote learning. Factors include not having basic needs such as food and shelter or internet access or competing demands of work and family. I couldn't find these commissioned reports. I was curious about the finding that almost half of Australia's children would fall behind by several weeks on numeracy and, and literacy. The second article reports on a study that looked at children's learning after the Christchurch earthquakes, where many schools were, chose, were, were closed for weeks and most did not even have access to any online learning. Professor John Hattie, the author of this study, found that many students in Christchurch, perhaps surprisingly, did better in their final exams and high school students did not in fact drop out. This finding showed that children do continue to do well or can continue to do well in school following school absence. So I was puzzled. Why such a discrepancy for these competing views? Perhaps the answer is in Hattie's conclusions. He said that teachers focused on what has to be learned instead of being focused on getting through the curriculum. In other words, the first article foregrounds curriculum and assessment and the second article foregrounds pedagogy and relationships. So we ask, can we pull back and recalibrate our expectations of learning to focus more on pedagogy as teachers know what is important to teach? And this in fact is their professional stock of knowledge. There are many more points and I'm sure that you also have reflections to add as we consider what to take forward. We don't want a new normal where everything has changed. And we don't want to go back to where we were before, but we do need to learn from the pandemic. So how should we go forward? The first way forward is to, is to debunk the myth that all children are digital natives. They don't magically know how to use digital technology. Many assume that they can, but they don't, either through not being interested, not having the capacity to engage, or parents making choices about their children not being involved. Even in a single family, can, there can be huge variation of digital technology uptake. Children might know how to navigate a, smoke phone, a smartphone in a cafe to play a favorite app, but they may not know how to use a mouse or a laptop. Children may be expert in users of technology, but not as producers. For instance, they may know how to play a game on the, on the device, but not, but not use digital software to be able to write a piece of text or create an image. And this goes way beyond just internet access. The second way forward is to ask, how do we reinvest in better ways to engage with learning? We trust teachers to know their learning communities. We reinvest in recognizing that the art of teaching is more than the delivery of curriculum. The third way forward is to acknowledge that the pandemic has exposed the vast digital divine divide for families and schools, which until now has been mostly hidden. And it's not just families who have digital inequity. Schools do too. Some schools have and some schools have not. A fundamental shift is required to tackle digital inequity. Fourth, we upskill learning communities. And this can't be directed to the schools. We cannot just throw materials at schools as solution. We also need to provide access to learning for communities and families to help change community fears about the dangers of technology, for example. We need to embrace sites of informal learning, engage in intergenerational learning. And of course, this requires funding to open new learning spaces that are open in locally relevant ways. 
This is not the work of the government or a select few. It requires a whole society approach across generations, demographics and communities. So how do we do this? We need to engage in mature and respectful debate as a starting point. How can we design new ways of engaging and learning to address a greater public good? And finally, we need to identify teachers as essential workers all the time and not forget them tomorrow. Everywhere I go, I hear parents singing the praises of teachers and the essential work that they're doing. So in the next slide, we see ABC and public broadcasting play a role in learning. Play School's been around for decades. What is somewhat surprising though, is how our commercial television stations have stepped up to the plate. Channel 7 has learning at home, Channel 9 has reading at home, and Channel 10 has coding at home. This partnership with the Queensland Government has been jointly developed with learning specialists and offers curriculum content to children from the early years through to year 12. I do hope that these kinds of partnerships will continue to flourish as we move forward. And now I'd like to tell you a little bit more about the recently awarded Australian Research Council Centre of Excellence for the Digital Child. We are in partnership with five other universities that you see here on the left of the screen. And as Mel said earlier, we're partnering, partnering with international universities and national and international partners. What is our approach in this centre? Our centre asks, how can all Australian children be healthy, educated and connected in a rapidly changing digital age? And of course, this has been made so much more urgent now um, through this pandemic we're, we're living through. Our goal is to actively show, shape positive futures for all children by focusing on our very youngest. Our inspiration grew from the questions that we were being asked by families, educators, health professionals, technology designers, and policy makers about the role of digital technology in children's lives. QET has a dedicated children's technology space in the new uh, $90 million education precinct building opened last year. This technology space will provide research facilities to investigate and support excellence in design of technologies for children and for research to be conducted in the most innovative and technologically rich environments. Our approach is a centre that brings together different fields, health, education, and digital and social connectedness. This is a transdisciplinary approach that involves researchers who are educators, psychologists, computer scientists, technology developers, media specialists, neuroscientists, health experts, child development experts, and many more to engage in rigorous research to deliver new knowledge. And this will be a public facing center to inform and guide evidence-based policy innovation and practice. So with the center, we'll be thinking about children's engagement in the digital world. It's not simple and we know it's becoming increasingly complex, even more so in this pandemic where the digital has rapidly transformed our everyday practices. We're working towards outcomes that will include a dedicated screen use policy on the whole child. So we no longer have conflicting messages to families. Future focused digital education practices to enhance learning. Positive technology design guidelines to support innovation in health and education. Clear frameworks for digital rights and digital safety. And of course, an enhanced research and professional workforce. The centre legacy is one that upscales Australia's capacity to respond to national issues related to young children. Our proposed centre legacy is to produce the next generation of children and young people who will understand digital risks and opportunities. And it enables them to be informed citizens with agency to critically engage with digital technology and be leading the digital knowledge economy even more important than ever before. And it is now my pleasure to hand the floor to Simone. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. And hi, everyone. So I'm going to shift the focus of our discussion from learners to educators and take a look at the changing role and work of educators through this pandemic and perhaps into the future. So when I say educators, I'm taking an inclusive definition here. By educators, I'm talking about 
all of those who are working in early childhood and preschool settings, teachers in schools and education leaders. I'd also include people like Suzanne and myself in this definition, as we are people who are working with the next generation of teachers. I'd also like to include parents in this group, perhaps controversially, but I do think parents and caregivers are a child's first educator. I'm not necessarily referring to them from a formal education perspective, although some do so through home education, but thinking about the role they play in a non-formal educative way and how they engage with other educators in a more formal way. I think this pandemic has seen a real shift actually through largely remote learning into how parents, families and educators grapple and become partners in education. And so through this next section, I look at the changes in education to both groups of parents and educators together. Okay, so let's take a closer look at what we are starting to see through this pandemic. I'd like to start with making some observations through an education lens. And I'm sure you are all seeing interesting aspects from your perspectives as well. And we welcome a conversation towards the end of this um, workshop. Okay, so the first observation I'd like to make is that I think more than ever, Australian society is witnessing firsthand the absolute vital role of schooling and education. I think all politicians and indeed families themselves are looking at those involved in formal education as now key to not only our economic productivity as a country, but also importantly to our social and emotional well-being as a society. These are big shoes to fill indeed. I think we are starting to witness, to some degree anyway, an understanding that educators do so much more than develop and deliver teaching material. I think there is a new realization of the importantly teacherly skills such as engaging, motivating, protecting, scaffolding, modeling and encouraging to name a few. I was watching a program the other day that was documenting a group of students in year 12 who were reflecting on their experiences in remote learning. And one young male was reflecting on his realization that his teachers were vital to his learning. He said they really encouraged and motivated him. And without them, he was feeling lost and unable to concentrate. This seemed to be the first time he was truly appreciating his teachers. For many children and students, not all, but for many, they are now begging their families to go back to school. So who would have thought? I'm sure all of you who are juggling remote learning with trying to work or learn yourself, you are also just as keen, if not begging, to see schools return to fully face-to-face -face teaching. While there is much debate at the moment about when and how schools might open, and I need to say this is not, that was not my area of expertise, uh, teachers have been busy teaching. They have not stopped. In many ways, perhaps doing a double shift, as they now are teaching in ever expanding new ways, which means teaching in what we call blended, blended learning, online and supporting, particularly vulnerable students and those who must attend school, and communicating even more with parents and caregivers through multiple forms of communication across the phone, email or internet, etc often well into the night and across their weekends, while also trying to look after their families and children. I think the teaching profession has never been busier. The second observation is how quickly the education workforce has pivoted. Possibly and arguably, no other profession has had to radically shift so fast to an expanding array of modes and mediums of learning and teaching. To turn a, a curriculum within a week often while still teaching, into a fully online set of learning activities and work to enable all students to work with learning devices, as Susan said, some who may not have had them in the past or you know, at home, um, is no mean feat. As Susan outlined, in some cases, educators have been helping source learning equipment for their students, working with a range of different support services to do so. This type of work speaks to the ability of teachers 
to best support their own students' learning needs. We are very fortunate in Australia, and I think this pandemic has shown that even more. We are very fortunate because we also have a very highly qualified, skilled and creative teaching profession. My third observation is to the important role parents and caregivers are playing throughout this whole change in schooling and education and with the recognition of the increased stress to them in doing so. It is interesting, however, to hear from parents and caregivers about what they themselves are noticing about their own children's um, and young people in their families' daily rhythms of learning. Parents are talking about what they notice about their own children's learning when they see their children are active or tired, what their learning interests and motivations are, and the types of content they like to engage with or not. Um, so this has been for parents and for some parents in particular, um, this has been an interesting study of seeing their own children um, through an educator's eyes that they may not have seen in the normal everyday. I think they are also reflecting on their own limitations when it comes to certain areas. From a general public, teaching is often viewed as a very easy job because people have all been to school and so they think it's just about a stand up and deliver information. I think this pandemic for some has started to provide a new window into the complexity and often subtle art and skill of teaching. For some parents and caregivers, this is a self-realization too of the fact they want to take an even more active role in education. And for others wondering how they can best support their own children and students when they themselves are feeling unequipped to do so. Okay, so while the research is happening around the changes to schooling and education as we speak, Let's turn our attention to some of the challenges and opportunities arising from this crisis. I want to take this opportunity to share with you all um, that in Australia, like in many countries actually, there is actually a dire teaching shortage, in my opinion, a crisis of its own. This shortage is often felt uh, in the communities that Susan and I grew up in, often in rural and remote communities, as well as in our lower socioeconomic areas, as well as in areas of high cultural and linguistic diversity, what is sometimes referred to as the harder to staff. We desperately need more teachers. This opportunity, uh, this crisis, presents itself for us as a society to use this opportunity to truly appreciate the education profession. I think let's face it, no one wants to work in a career that is undervalued and often constantly criticised. If we can turn this opportunity to value and appreciate all educators and teachers, this could contribute to a shift in the perception of the value of the profession itself. Teachers, like nurses, are often undervalued, but through this pandemic, we see, we may see a change to those who want to contribute now to the health profession. If we take the same approach to valuing and appreciating those who teach, we may, we may start to turn the tide uh, in addressing the current teaching shortage. We need to use this opportunity to encourage school leavers, those who are finishing year 12, and career changes to come into the wonderful work of the teaching profession. And we need to ensure we maintain our high standards and our qualifications to do so. So clearly this crisis has meant teachers, educators have had to pivot and adjust to an ever expanding new set of skills and roles. The new hybrid learning environments mean new modes of working. So questions are how to support our teaching profession in a way that best fits their complex roles and lives? How do we upskill a profession, however, that is already stretched in this crisis to be able to support, in turn, their own students? 
I think there is a shift perhaps, and this has already been occurring and this pandemic may, may ramp this situation, that there is an opportunity to look at smaller bite size, um, asynchronous, so in their own time, professional learning opportunities. So in the Faculty of Education, and I'm aware that in, in other professional associations, et cetera, are, are also doing the same and other universities are also doing the same. But for us from QUT, we've launched recently a completely free set of professional learning support materials. And you can see the, the, the link there, and we'll be sharing this slide, of course. Um, this website, this, um, this landing page, houses a range of modes of learning, including activities and games and examples and videos, and also our new um, pod class series, which are a set of free podcasts for teachers and parents. We have just ticked over 20,000 downloads um, just recently. So it's showing that teachers are really engaged with these sort of bite-sized little, you know, motivations and learning. Uh, just to share with you here um, a bit more about this notion of micro-learning or micro-credentials. As I said, it's not necessarily new. Um, it has been around for a while, but I think this pandemic has started to, to um, enhance its opportunity for teacher professional development. So you'll see here at QUT, we've embarked on a range of micro-credentials for teachers in the profession. So these are a set of either free, or there is a small fee for some modules that teachers can dip into. They're fully online and they're over an extended period of time. So if you think of a teacher professional development that might happen in one day, um, it would be spread over a period of time to allow people to go in, to learn, to come back and visit in their own time in the way that best suits them. If teachers wish, they can also bundle their learning together to count towards a postgraduate degree. So we have a range of topics. Uh, here are just two that you can see. The one on the left is about phonics and phonemic awareness and uh, a very popular topic actually at the moment. And the one on the right, uh, also very popular given the COVID um, environment, is about how teachers can create their own apps to best meet their student needs. So rather than uh, necessarily download or um, have a commercialized um, app that doesn't necessarily meet their own children's needs, teachers can actually create apps to meet their own students' needs. So we have, a variety of um, topics and pathways that will also, um, that includes sort of topics, sadly, actually a, a very popular topic is um, working with students with complex trauma uh, that teachers can, um, can learn about. There's also working with students um, with autism, for example, and other topics, for example, like, um, on, you know, how to develop an entrepreneurial mindset and when we think about the switch that's happened, how many businesses have pivoted and so quickly changed pace, I think in our society, we need even more curious, creative citizens, um, you know, into the future. So a final challenge and an opportunity I'd like to raise is the changing relationship in the potential partnership between educators and parents and caregivers. What we have noticed already through our um, variety of professional development support, either those that are free or those that have a small fee, is that parents are very keen to learn more as, as they can, obviously, in their busy lives. We have found in particular, for example, the phonics for those who are working with young children uh, is very popular uh, with parents and also education related fields. We think parent support is a growing area of need and more parents and caregivers will demand new ways of partnership and working together into the future. So speaking of the future, finally, what might, might lie ahead? Uh, I just wanted to share with you some possibilities and these are of course speculative. So as stated, it looks like some parents and caregivers will want to take a much more active role where they can in shaping and contributing to new partnership models and more flexible models of education. This pandemic offers a new space for a joined up education or hybrid workforce.
that can facilitate teachers and educators through the blending learning opportunities. Teachers and systems will need to look to new ways of professional learning, perhaps through that micro-credential, those micro-learning pathways into the award courses that might better suit the professional learning of the education workforce in general. I do believe new jobs and education careers will most likely bloom from these hybrid spaces into the future. So in conclusion, overall, what I think this pandemic has done is uncover the invaluable resource that is education, the importance of lifelong learning and the true value of educators and highlighted that the world of education will be now ever more complex and take new hybrid forms into the future. We feel at QUT, we are opening up these spaces to better cater for the diversity and needs of educators, both our pre-service, which I haven't spoken about today, and our in-service. And we are keen to learn more about how we can best support leaders, educators, to build capacity into the future. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for listening. Uh, we welcome your observations, your ideas. I haven't been able to see the chat. I will now have a look at the chat as well and to see what people have been discussing and thinking. And I'm going to, uh, and we welcome the opportunity for conversations as well. But for now, I'm going to hand back to Christy and to Melinda for the final section of this workshop. Thank you so much, Susan and Simone, for those really valuable insights. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for all your thoughtful questions you've been posting on our Q&A um, icon. Now, Christy Hammond, our Corporate Partnership Manager for the Education Sector, has been collating those, theming those, and pulling together a representative cross-sample to put to our panellists on your behalf. So I'll now invite Christy to take the microphone. Thank you, Melinda. And thanks to everyone. Such an engaged um, bunch this morning. The, the questions are coming through left, right and centre, which is wonderful. Um, as Melinda mentioned, I've tried to sort of collate and theme some of these areas. So apologies, we certainly won't get to everybody's question. Um, but Susan, I might start with a question to yourself. And, and this came through from, from a number of different people, from slightly different angles. Um, with teachers and students, of course, now returning to the more traditional classroom and, and working through what that means to them at the moment, do you have any insight into some early reflections from both the teachers or the educators and the students um, themselves as, as to what worked during this pandemic time of, of being remote? Uh, thanks very much, Christy. I, I, uh, as I was um, thinking about this, um, I was thinking how important that the voices of the young people have been largely missing from this discussion. And as someone who's a researcher in this space, there's um, such um, concern because on one level, you really want to be talking with families and educators and children and finding out about their perspectives on this. The other hand, you know that there, many of them are uh, really up to the, to their, um, just completely involved in just getting through the day and having to manage what it is they have to manage and to have further conversations around that potentially might be you know, we need to be sensitive to the, the situations so um, I think it would be fantastic when when things if things settle down a bit we do have those conversations we'll learn so much from talking with the children about how they wanted to learn and we need to make sure that we um, hear from the diversity of children children across different demographics, children who learn in different ways. We know that different children have different learning styles and um, different challenges and different strengths. And we want to hear from all of those children as well. That's a particular interest of mine to hear from the children's perspectives. And it doesn't, and I think also it's important for teachers to do that sort of work in their classroom. You know, they can have chats with their children about that. What worked really well for you? What did you like? How do you think you learned best? and to really turn this situation into a positive future to rethink through some of the teaching styles, some of the ways that, that learning is already happening in classrooms. Um, so I also think it's, it's not about going back to the traditional classroom perhaps ever. I think it's around, as I said before, we don't want to throw out um, the baby with the bathwater, but at the same time, we don't want to think that everything is brand new. So it's going to be a very um, interesting time, a challenging time 
uh, and also an exciting time as we think about how we might learn in this in this particular space. And um, there are a couple of questions around technology, and I, I, I want to say up front, I'm my interest uh, in technology is around what does it mean for the everyday life of families and educators. Uh, I don't come from a technology background at all, uh, but I'm interested to how, see how this phenomenon is shaping and influencing family and educators and other people's lives. And that's where I think we've got so much to learn in this space. Wonderful, thank you, Susan. Um, the next question, again, from a number of people is um, highlighting the issues, of course, as, as Australians um, working through some mental health and wellbeing challenges at the moment with um, things quite different to the world we knew. So the group's interested to understand, you know, how both educators and children um, are receiving mental health support and wellbeing support throughout these times. A question to either of you. <laughs> I think this is a, a difficult one. Um, as I said, uh, sadly, one of our most popular, um, we have a free MOOC, so it's a, it's a global um, learning platform. It's an equivalent of a two hour sort of, um, professional learning um, is incredibly, incredibly popular. And so what it shows is that educators and teachers around the world are really are trying to work in the best ways with a range of students who have um, you know, suffered from a range of complex trauma. And in itself, and I think most people um, can appreciate that, uh, that in itself is traumatic for those who are working uh, with um, children and young people and families. So even the, the knowledge of what um, young people have experienced and are going through in itself is a traumatic experience. And we've witnessed so much trauma uh, here in Australia this year, but also around the world and, and what we see on the news. So I think, and maybe this is a, a, you know, a side benefit, which sounds strange in this world, is the opportunity to be kind, <laughs> kinder to ourselves and kinder to each other and take that pressure off um, these, you know, this ever sort of expanding testing sort of, you know, um, metrics sort of scale. And actually what, we're sh what, what this pandemic is doing is showing the, the measures of success that can be actually community mindedness, collaboration, good communication, opportunity to um, to not all be the same exact you know but to actually celebrate our strength so it's a it's an in, it's very interesting I mean we're all going through this and so there'll be many research studies forever I think from from this period of time way way into future centuries I suppose and millennia um, around this this what's actually happening I think it, it's real um, mental health is you know, the government's focus on mental health and um, prioritising um, a chief health officer, I think, in this space really is showing the importance of it, which I think is um, so valuable. And I think for us to really um, consider and to look at new ways we can support students and trauma will be different across in different regions and communities as well. Um, just to piggyback from that question that was asked of Susan earlier or that Susan responded to, I think um, good communication will be key into the future as, I mean, we've got uh, staggered situations going for across different states. We've got, for example, the, the little ones, the preps and the ones, you know, the two, you, you know, you, you two are going back and then the older ones are going back. And I think we're going to have a lot of, um, we talked about hybrid, you know, different sort of spaces. So schools will not necessarily be in that normal routine or timetabling, and that will be different and a little bit scary, particularly for those students who love routine and, and need routine. And so again, it's going to be about communication, clear communication, respectful communication. I think we've seen a lot of ads about how people should respect health workers and those who are working at, um, you know, sort of different shops, etc. I think it's the same principles applying to everybody, respectful uh, communication. Thank you. Thanks, Simone. Um, a question here, a number of questions around excursions and, and I guess um, of recent times there have been incursions given technology. 
Um, so Susan, you may want to touch on this, but of course, children love an excursion and, and um, pre-pandemic that of course has usually been face-to-face -face and into the community. Yes. There was some commentary around, you know, visiting museums and zoos and the like. And, and again, you touched on that in your presentation in bringing that into a virtual classroom. But how do you see the future trend there continuing? Um, you know, do you see, a, I guess, a combination or a hybrid of, of virtual and face-to-face? -face? It, it, um, it reminds me when I first started preschool teaching, I was teaching in a, a rural Queensland and we used to take the children down to the local creek and we'd have a fire and we'd, roast marshmallows and we'd learn about the bush and all these things. Of course, we would do it just by telling the principal that's, that's where we were off to. And of course now, that is just so far from anybody's possibility of imagination, uh, which is sort of sad in some ways, but again, we understand the, the safety things around that. Um, I love that the world is, is now, the, the outside world is really blending with the world of the classrooms and the homes. There was a great comment by Georgie who asks about, should we be collaborating with creative technology, technologists, such as uh, artists, designers, developers? And absolutely, I hope that this is one of the real strengths that come out of this. Um, so that I, I, I do think it is still really important to, to be able to work um, and have access to the outside world. But for many, um, particularly as we're going forward, we don't know how long all of this will, will last. So it's probably unlikely that the year seven kids will do the trip to Canberra that they've often done and things like that. And so we need to be really creative and inventive in the way that we bring those rich experiences to it. Um, the other point I'd like to make is we can never, never uh, forget and the, the, the really importance, the significance of face-to-face -face communication. Simone was identifying communication as being important. We will never want to have a world where learning is only done through the screen or through digital. And I think the other point to make around that too is online learning uh, or learning in the digital world doesn't necessarily mean a screen. It might mean particular uh, you know, uh, materials such as bbots or other physical materials that can, and objects that you work with in that space. Um, and that's something that can happen without the internet, for instance. So I think we need, this is a fantastic opportunity for us to broaden and really explore what is digital technology, particularly beyond the screen or beyond the internet. And one more very quick question before I hand back to Melinda. Simone, a question um, for you, a very quick one, um, and from a lot of the uh, teachers on the line today, they're asking the question around, again, when we look into the future, do we need more teachers? So is it a supply issue or do we need better teachers? I, I think that, uh, I think we have excellent teachers. Uh, I think that we, we have seen over a number, maybe the last two decades in particular, a decline in our teaching profession as I said earlier, in particular in certain um, communities. And so I do think, uh, and so maybe we actually have teachers who have, who have got their qualifications already, but have chosen another career or have gone another pathway. So perhaps we do actually have teachers who would love to go back to the classroom, but uh, for, for a variety of reasons, and perhaps it is that undervaluing that I was talking about that constant criticism um, and the, the difficulties that many teachers have experienced. Um, so we maybe do have more teachers who would come back um, into the teaching profession. As I said, for me, and when I see the difference, you know, that, that, that nightly clapping, that, that, that valuing, that real support means so much to the health profession and, and, and rightly so. And, I'm, and, I've, and that's why I was reflecting. If, if we could take that same approach of appreciation, of gratitude, teachers are not, they, you know, they're working so, so hard. And, you know, as I said, you know, probably more than ever. And they just need that valuing. It's such a simple thing that society can do. And look, I don't know if it's going to make a difference in, in getting more people into the teaching profession. But I do think that cultural valuing of our frontline workers, and we've, we've seen who they are, um, it, that makes a difference. It makes a difference to people's feelings of, you know, I want to be in this profession. Yes, that's why I'm here. That's what I'm doing. 
And I do feel that will would make a difference to teachers. So I do think that, you know, we can lift up our status of our profession just by the valuing and the gratitude. I, I do want to see new teachers coming to our universities next year. Uh, we need them. We've been very mindful of our fourth years and our second year of our MM teach, making sure that they're ready to go next year. So we're, you know, I'm sure um, this is very, very important message to get out to, to all people considering the teaching profession. Wow. Thank you, Christy. Thank you, Simone and, and Susan. What a feast of insights we've enjoyed this morning. And it's my job to try to, um, to pull together, revisit some of the delicious morsels we've been served. Will homeschooling be the norm of the future? No. And I can hear all the parents out there breathing a big sigh of relief for that one. Are we entering a time of increased appreciation for our teachers? Hopefully, from what we've heard, yes. And what a good thing that would be. Will it mean the end of children grumbling about going to school this experience? Short term, probably yes. Long term, who knows? And are we all going to need greater digital skills and capabilities to remain lifelong learners ourselves to keep up? Definitely. My big takeaways is that whilst technolo technological change is again the hair speeding away, the law and regulation around this is still the tortoise. And still we have a huge gap that's highlighted between what we can do and what we should do. What are the equity issues around the digital divide and how do we, how do we address it? So again, this need for ethical decision-making from all of our leaders in all of our sectors around this difference. And we're committed to doing something about ethical decision-making in our courses here. The other is that whilst digital, digital transformation has become the COVID catch cry, across all sectors, there's still a lot of uncertainty about the how of digital, which is why along with the education faculty, we at QTX have established a digital capability practice, which is about micro-credentialing in stackable micro-learning skills for business, which is also available here. So when will we see you again, ladies and gentlemen? Our next Real World Futures event is scheduled for Thursday, the 25th of June. We'll make it earlier to accommodate the fact that schools will probably all be back. Um, our topic will be artificial intelligence and the smart city, and we'll feature the excellent Professor Tan Yigit Khan from our Faculty of, of Science and Engineering. So until then, please stay safe. Keep your feedback coming, particularly about topics you'd like us to address into the future. And um, we look forward to seeing you again. Good morning. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.